Hello everyone. Uh, very good evening. And today we are here to discuss about how marketing can be used. Some of the concepts of marketing can be used in uh, new product development. I have a quick uh, presentation. Let me load it right up and uh, we can get started. Right, so let's get started. So some of you may be signed up for the Hajj Hackathon Challenge, which has a variety of problem statements. And uh, a quick back of the envelope shows me that more than 2 million people come to the Hajj during this time. And that opens up a lot of challenges for us. And some of them are mentioned here. So how do we get started? And what, are, what role does marketing play in that? So if, if you are going to participate in a hackathon, I'm going to teach you some tricks and trips to hack an hackathon so that you come out winning. Or let's simply call it as, how do you build a kick-ass kick -ass product? So there are, you know, everything that can be invented has been invented. This was said in the year 1899 by the gentleman who was heading the patents committee at that time. So this was three years before commercial jets were made, couple of years before even vacuum cleaners were made. And imagine the possibilities, imagine the products that has come out in the last 150 years. So any new product, any new concept is not, we are only limited by our imagination. And it, 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 it surely is a process of observing your customers. So most of the startups that I've interacted with get it, get too obsessed with their product, right? As opposed to being obsessed with their customers. So I'm gonna start by giving you an example how you know the need for music has been there forever, but how the way we listen to music has changed over time. So in the in the eighties, people used to carry this boom box on their shoulder and run on go for a jogging. And then in the 90s, we had Walkman. Some Sony came up with the Walkman. And then people were like uh, excited because they could carry their favorite music on there uh, in a much smaller, convenient way. And nearly for the next 10 years, nothing much happened. But we didn't stop listening to music until iPod came along. And it changed the way we listen to music. And of course, iPod itself was disrupted when uh, smartphones came, and thanks to Apple. And then finally, the way we listen to music now has come down to a, a live streaming through our watches and other smart devices. So the, the point here is the need for music has always been the same. And the need for music on the go has always been the same. But the way we listen has changed. And it's made possible by new products being developed. And they were, being, they were possible because somebody was paying attention to the customer's needs. So what are we discussing today? How did, how did Apple and Sony make such products? It, it all starts with whether you decide to be a product-centric company or a customer-centric company. I will tell you the differences in a minute. It's about understanding customers' needs and wants to generate great product ideas. It's screening of those ideas to test feasibility and market acceptance. And finally, commercialization, which means you are in a real business and not just another idea. So the four parts, the part one is about deciding whether you are a product-centric company or a marketing-centric company. Product-centric companies are usually a me-too kind of a company. They could be making a commodity of sorts. It could be uh, one more brand of cloth, one more brand of pencils, one more brand of uh, something trivial that you use every day. So the only price differentiation, differentiation they might have is in cheaper prices or mass availability. So the way they look at organization is all the functional roles, including marketing, research, product development, all focuses towards the product that they've already conceived. So the customer lives outside the product development life cycle, right? So it's like saying, okay, let's create a search engine. Imagine if Google had said, let's create a search engine when there were already dozens of search engines when they started. But the difference in a customer-centric company or essentially what we call as marketing-centric companies is they put the consumer the heart of the product development cycle. The products are born as a function of observing customer needs and wants. So essentially, the most important person in a marketing-centric organization is not the CEO or the product head, but the customer. 
So these are the companies that listen to their customers very carefully and build products based on that. So that, that sim relates to the Hutch Hackathon uh, agenda that we have. Millions of people come there on the holiest trip and they have a lot of challenges which we can solve using technology, right? So look at the Google's uh, simplest mission statement to organize the world's information and make it available and accessible. So that's what they did. That's why they didn't stop at the web search. They have an image search. They had video search. They had maps. They even have indoor searches for historic places like and museums, and it never ends, right? So the way we look at information is completely different because they are paying attention to our information needs and wants. So what's going to be your style? Are you going to be a product-centric company where you put the customer outside and you think you you got it all figured? Or are you going to be a marketing-centric company where you are going to put your customer, their challenges, and their problems at the center of your agenda? It is highly recommended that you take the marketing-centric approach. So if, if we were to take some popular companies and determine how do they fit or how do they define themselves if, we, if they were to be a defined in product definition versus a marketing definition. So if you look at Facebook, it's another social network. So that is the that's a very product way of calling them. But from a marketing point of view, they are a company that makes people share moments and stay connected with their friends and families around the world. If you look at NASA, they may be sending rockets to the outer space, but that's not really what they do. They are exploring places that we have never been before, learning about things that we didn't we couldn't otherwise imagine. And all those learnings comes back to help humanity step forward. So that is how we put customer in center of a product development. It's all about the mindset of to be a marketing centric organization. So marketing centering is all about empathy with your customer. So if you can step into their shoes for a moment and think if if think of think the way they think, feel the way they do. You, you are, by definition, a marketing-centric company. So that's all it takes. Just take a moment to think about your customer. So you know, there's a popular saying, we don't know whether Henry Ford said it or not, that if I ask people what do they want, they might say faster horses. They would have never said they need cars, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's, it's not about asking customers what they want, because most of the time, they do not know what they want. I don't think any customer would have predicted they need an iPod. They would have said, we, not, we need more music or better battery life. At best, that's all they could have said. It's your job to innovate and come up with a product that they accept, which addresses their needs and wants. So understanding their needs and generating product ideas starts with you know, how much data or how, much, how well do you understand your customer. So every time you are reading a Kindle, is its Kindle is reading you back. It knows where you stopped, what kind of books you prefer, where did you bookmark, so on and so forth. The same with Netflix. Netflix prides themselves in calling. Uh, you know, they have 100 million customers, so they call themselves as we have 100 million versions of Netflix because they keenly watch you when you are watching Netflix, and they try to customize every piece of information, and they suggest content based on your preferences. And not just this kind of digital companies, even a brick and mortar company like a Target, their CEO gets hands dirty, goes to the store, shops with the local customers, and gets insights. And this are, there are many, many more examples of beauty salons and pizza places sending mystery customers uh, to their shops and find out how customer, consumer behavior happen at a ground level and come back to the product development and use those insights to build better products and services. So you might not be a Kindle or a Netflix, but that doesn't mean you cannot have data. So you need to make start making with some reasonable assumptions. And that assumption can't be, I know it all. The assumptions has to start with some robust robust model. And, and data is all over the place. It's, it's freely abundantly available. The, today, there is a wealth of information available at all points. So you can learn, you can use Google. Uh, keyword tools, you can use Google Trend Search, you can use the AdWord tools, there is free data available, there is statistics, there's a lot of tools available to at least build a basic data model on what your customers are looking for 
and then you back to integrate that into the product development idea. Another classic example of building products is by observing human needs. It, this model by Maslow has stood the test of time. So we all have physiological needs like food, water, and then it goes into like, I need a home, a good quality car, and then a good job, and I need to be popular. And then you, you need like self-esteem needs, like you want to be the richest man on the planet or the most accomplished person or a Nobel Prize. And after a point, you become self-actualized where you are, you are a saint, practically a saint. You no longer have any materialistic desires. So the, you know, when, when you're starting off a, a, any human being, let's say they are starting their life in a humble, modest way, maybe they want a car that takes them from point A to B, right? But as they become successful, they uh, upgrade their car and aspire to buy bigger and bigger and better cars all the way until they buy a Ferrari or something like that. Right. And once they even have that, they realize that I no longer need this. Maybe they start bicycling to their work or they come back. Uh, you would have seen billionaires bicycling. Right. It's not that they can't afford a Ferrari, but they no longer need it. So the human needs kind of dictates what he or she a person opens their wallet out for, right? So we need to understand the product that you are building, what kind of a human need does it satisfy, and how much money will somebody be willing to pay for it? The third step is about screening of ideas through market acceptance. So what does market mean and what does market acceptance mean? So, you know, brand stuff, test their ideas uh, in, in reality all the time. So if you have seen like consumer exhibitions like CES, uh, this was about Philips testing their smart sleep, uh, the headband, which lets people get better sleep. Uh, they were testing it out at the CES Las Vegas exhibition last year. So many brands uh, come to such exhibitions. Many brands give us early access, access uh, to it's their most loyal customers. All this is because They've already developed the product, put in you know, months of efforts and millions of dollars, but they are really not sure how the market accepts their product. So it's a prudent idea to take a look, take your product early on to the market, see how it works, what customers have the feedback, come back, fix it before you take it again. So it could be a rapid prototype of an idea that came out of a design sprint. It could be an early working prototype that you built or it could be a fully developed product. You are confident it worked in one particular market, but now you are expanding. So maybe you want to test it in the new market before you fully expand it. So that's one way to look at it. Another way is, you know, there are, there are uh, some people, some brands even make customers pay for products even before it is launched. So in this case, the you know the the uh, Pamu or the Padmate. Uh, earphones, it, it really cost about $30, which does exactly the same job as a Bose uh, speakers, which are of the same quality and build and cost about $300. So they, they even ran an Indigo campaign and they raised about uh, a, close to a million dollars, which was about 9,000 times more than their uh, estimated uh, wish right so sometimes customers will show you their love and and the validation of that love is they are even willing to pay for it lego one of the products most people love it's one of the most loved brands world over children and adults play with it but still they don't think they know it all they don't have that attitude of we build products that people will blindly love they still fall back on their customers to be their product designers. So Lego constantly runs a, a, a platform called Lego Ideas. So where any of the Lego's uh, customers can go register and suggest ideas. And there are multiple products that has come out, uh, come out of it over the years. And thanks to ardent fans of uh, Lego Bricks. So there are multiple ways in which you can get your customers in part of your product development. It doesn't have to be your lone struggle in a lab. You can bring them aboard in multiple ways. You just need to ask them nicely. You can incentivize them, you can excite them, but please take customers in your journey of product development. 
So people may like your idea, but are they really willing to pay for it? So most of the startups struggle with this syndrome. They build, they take a really small or a very corner use case, which they might have gone through in, in their life. And then they say, okay, if, if I have this problem, maybe many people have it too. And they spend a lot of time developing a solution for it without realizing that it's not nearly a need that somebody is willing to pay for. So these are two completely different terms. Somebody saying that, yes, it, it you know, it's like a uh, mobile battery life. We all need better mobile battery life. That doesn't mean you can create something like a nuclear powered mobile battery device, which is you never need to charge again, but it's going to cost you a million dollars to have that, right? So things like that sounds ridiculous, but there are many people who, who build ideas which are unrealistic or there is no market for it at all. So you need to be very cognizant of what kind of product you are building. And like I said, it comes from talking to your customers. All you need to do is ask them nicely. So the most important bit and the last critical piece is about commercialization. So this is the part where most people struggle. This is multiple reasons for this. Uh, one of that is when two or three tech only co-founders come together, they think of a beautiful product, they quickly build it and then they don't know what to do with it, right? So they never thought about the commercial angle to it. Commercial angle is not just about the money. Commercial angle is also about the product launch strategy, the product rollout strategy, the product pricing, how are you differentiating, right? So let's take a quick look at it. So first and foremost is about product rollout phases. You need to figure out what is your MVP, which what is that one single uh, promise that you are making which a customer is willing to use your product and the second important piece is who's paying your bills you might be a funded you might be looking at raising funds all that aside over the next five years or the ten years if, if you were to be a real product you need to figure out who's going to be paying your bills right so let's take a look at some examples when when you know, think of all the big tech companies, Twitter, Google, Facebook, you know, when they all launched, they were really crappy and they did, but they looked crappy in design, which continuously was, but they were never crappy in the single thing that they started, right? So Google is always good in search. Twitter has always been succinctly expressing yourself. Facebook was always good with connecting you with other people. There are Evernote is always good in keeping tab of your notes. There is multiple products, you know, which started in a very humble way with only one feature in it, but that feature was damn good. So you need to not worry about looking good, but you need to worry about delivering the promise that you made. So shipping fast is the number one challenge of commercialization. So you need to figure out the rollout phases. What are you rolling out first? And is that the single reason that customers will adopt? And if you are if you are a business that has a supply and a demand side, like uh, let's say Uber, Uber has the supply side where there are drivers, you need to onboard them. And on the demand side, there are customers who uh, invoke the app or call for a ride on it through an app. So you need to balance it both. Are you going to get the supply side first? Are you going to get the demand side first? How how does how do you get the process started? Right. It's all sometimes it's also called popularly the network effect. So how you are when you have 500 million customers, it might make sense. But when you have 50 customers, it may not make sense at all. So how do you solve for the cold start problem? So on and so forth. So you need to have a approach for this. It could be about launching it in a single vertical or in a single geographic region and then growing it to different markets, or it could be you have seen a similar product work in a different market. Now you are culturally making it fit in your market and you know giving it a new flavor. That's fine as long as you deliver on your promise of uh, you know delivering what you promised for. And the essential piece that most people miss out in building a new product is the revenue model or asking the golden question of, who's paying the bills. So if you take an example of, let's say all the Google products that we love using on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, Google Photos, Google Maps, Google Search, so on and so forth. 
it's all free for the end consumer, right? But who's really paying the bills? Who, how does Google make money? If you take an example of one of the most valuable tech company in the world, they have a clear triangular relationship. They have, you know, between Google, there is a consumer and there is a customer. The consumer are you and me who use Google's products. And there is the customer, which is which are the brands and businesses which come to Google to use their advertising product and reach the end consumer. So it's it's Google's responsibility that they maintain the delicate balance between their customers and their consumers, and you know pro deliver their promise for both of them. So if if you are building a new product, one of the re challenges you would have is who's going to be paying your bills so is that money going to come if, if you have a free tier mod price model so how much how much of the services are you willing to give it as a freemium or if you are going to be a completely paywalled solution so then what are the pricing models that you have does customer see value in it or if you have a triangular relationship between like you know some enterprises or customers come to you for paying the bills but end consumers use it for free then you need to figure out a robust B2B strategy that will monetize your product. So that only gets complicated because your product is seen from both the sides. A customer, paying customer looks at it very differently versus the using consumer who's going to be looking at it very differently. So this is one of the reasons why most of the game developers, if you have seen, uh, they, they really uh, you know, give a very uh, bad experience in their game because they have too many pop-up ads or the monetization is done in a very crappy way. So it, it doesn't go well uh, with the end user playing the game, right? So it's okay to be ad-supported model. It's one of the oldest model and it's really a great model to be in, in an ad-supported format. But you need to have a delicate balance between showing ads and not disrupting the user experience. So in sum, what we have is you need to start by identifying a need and providing a realistic solution. You need to, and that starts when you start listening to your customers. You need to match benefits to cost. Is somebody really willing to pay the money that you are asking? Whether it's a dollar or 10, doesn't matter. But is somebody seeing value in what you are selling? And then it's really important to get started and moving fast. So it's not about the beauty of the product that really sells it. It's about what it can deliver to you. So when it comes to advertising and marketing, it's not just a campaign. You can't just do a few promoted posts here and some adverts there and get away with it. Marketing is what you put in the heart of your company. It's a commitment. So when you say you are a marketing first company, you are actually saying you're a customer first company. So marketing is all about understanding customers and then delivering on those needs. And finally, do not forget money matters and think who will be paying your bills. So if I were to judge a business or to get into any product development, I will look at essentially all these products and some of the crucial pieces, the revenue model. So we have at least uh, another 15 minutes with us. So I'm going to be uh, looking at some of the questions and comments that I got in the uh, chat and on Twitter and on LinkedIn. So if you have any more questions, you can, uh, if you have more questions, you can ask me on uh, Twitter or you can ask here on the chat and you can stay connected on um, Twitter as well. So let's take a moment to answer some of the questions. If you guys have some questions, please bring it up right away. We can discuss it. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me any question. It's you no know, question is a, a silly question. Let's give it a minute or two.
Uh, the hackathon would be about, I think uh, some of the organizers may be the right uh, person to answer this, but the hackathon essentially will be about, you know, creating an impactful idea that can solve the challenges that was outlined to you, right? So if you've seen the website, uh, it has some of the challenges listed out there. It, it involves logistics, food, communication, so if you can build a comprehensive solution for any of those problems, it could be mobility, it could, it could be on communication, any, any of your chosen field, uh, think about building a robust solution. That's, that's what the hackathon is all about. And that's what any hackathon is all about. Okay, there is a question from Mr. Singh. In your opinion, what should be the first element we must have in place about budgeting for a startup? Great question, uh, Mr. Singh. So, if if you know the the primary reason a company exists is to serve its customer, so you need to keep an estimate or, or make a budget saying what is the core product you are building and at the stage of launch uh, what would it be right and then work backward to figure out how many people you are going to need and what process and, and systems and equipments you are going to need to deliver that promise right so if if you are let's say you are starting a uh, podcast and and you, you you are promising your customers that you are the best podcast uh, in all of middle east so then how much of content do you really have right and then work backwards saying okay we are going to launch with 500 hours of content and it's going to take this 20 member team on six months and maybe another six months until we start monetizing so that's an easy way to budget it start working backward uh, from the date of launch of a product Okay, uh, there is another excellent question by Mr. Shari. So an MVP with one feature might not be the right product. Uh, MVP with one feature is actually a great product. So do not count the success of your product based on the features. You need to measure success of a product based on the customer satisfaction that you are able to get. So the, you know the classic MVP diagram. Uh, you could be building a roller skates. It still takes me from one place to other. You could build a bicycle. It takes me from one place to other. You can build a motorbike that takes me from one place to other. Or you can build a a car which has a AC and a lot of facilities and features that takes me from one place to other. So it's not about number of features in an MVP. It's about solving a need fully so if you can solve a need fully that's an mvp for me we have about 10 minutes so uh, feel free to ask any more questions you have anything about the hackathon anything about marketing in general anything about uh, other google products like adwords or admob monetization Okay, Mr. Anil is asking about how to estimate marketing cost. Great. So large companies, you know, the large FMCG companies that sells soaps and detergents, they have a simple, uh, you know, formula. They calculate about uh, one to two percent of their uh, revenue as marketing budgets. When I say marketing budgets. Here I'm referring to advertising dollars, not marketing that includes market research and customer care, so on and so forth. So if, it, if, if, and if you do not have an existing product and it's another, another way to work towards a marketing plan, 
is about estimating about 15 to 20 percent on the estimated reach so uh, on the estimated revenue so let's say you want to make hundred dollars of revenue in a given time and if you are a new product being launched in the market i would keep about 20 dollars as the entire advertising cost and as your product becomes more and more accepted you can gradually reduce the advertising dollars and perhaps maybe look at a loyalty pro loyalty program or some other ways to get your customers back without spending additional dollars to reach the same customer any more questions people i'm here okay vinayak what parameters would you consider while deciding how much time and resources a startup should invest in a product and which of the parameter to let go of product and try something new so vinayak there are two questions in this i will try to answer them one by one uh, others keep bringing your questions on we have about seven minutes more and we can really put it to good use so vinayak uh, what parameters would you consider while deciding how much time and resources as a startup should invest so if you take a very revenue centric approach you can look at uh, how much potential does your product has in the market to generate right so if you are going to go after a million people at the same time uh, then that's a lot of parameters to consider but if you're building something niche let's say you are targeting uh, you know mothers with children aged 0 to 6 months so that puts a circle or that puts defines your audience very well and then you can look at the addressable market and say okay in my region or in my country i have uh, x number of moms who have a child of age 0 to 6 months and you know this is the total addressable market and i might reach about 10% of them and 1% of them might buy or try my product so that's the that's one of the parameters that uh, is the golden parameter with which you start how many what's the total addressable market and how many customers can you tap and then work backward on the parameters required uh there's a couple of more questions coming in. Any good references, URLs on how to hack a hackathon? Uh, Mr. Shari, I just made up that stuff saying how to hack a hackathon. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of resources available on best practices of hackathon. But essentially, the hackathon websites, they usually uh, will have a guide or a points which they you know, clearly publish on the parameters on which they will be judging. So if I'm not wrong, it should it it will be about the design, the impact, the core product idea, and a panel of judges will be doing it. So it's good that uh, you take those parameters into consideration. Mr. Singh asks another question: What are the essential marketing tools in present industry? So the biggest tool in the industry today is about data, right? So we did not have this amount of data even five years ago. This is unprecedented amount of data and we can mine a lot of insights from it. Consumer behavior, what do people like? How do people consume something? What are the people uh, saying about something? Even their sentiments about a particular product or a particular uh, service. And then you tailor your offerings based on consumer insights. So this much of data and database tools, business intelligence tools, data visualization tools did not exist even five years ago. So that's the biggest tool we have right now. OK, I am not really sure about the chicken and egg problem here. But if you are, Mr. Ben, if you are referring to the, uh, the Cold start problem when you have a demand side and supply side in a in a uh, company like the Uber example we were discussing, I would recommend that you start with the supply side. If if you were to start a cab aggregator, uh, maybe first thing you need to do is get thousand x number of cabs on your app and then go to customer and say, hey, look, we have cabs in your area. That's how you solve the chicken or egg problem. 
couple more minutes, people. Uh, we can take a couple more questions. We have about uh, three minutes, and I'm very, very happy that uh, this audience is so much participative in a very productive way. Any more questions? Uh, OK. I'm going to give it a couple more seconds there. Uh, the people who are watching it, would you like to have the presentation made available somewhere, or is the video enough? Uh, yes, Mr. Ben, I'm very, very likely to be there at the event from uh, July 31st to 3rd August. I'm just waiting for some paperwork to be done. All right, uh, we have about two minutes. And if we, you don't have any more questions, uh, I'm going to call it tonight. So people will be at the hackathon. I will see you in person, or rather, I would hope to see you in person. Uh, others who have been part of this, uh, great talking to you. We have been a wonderful audience uh, asking really worthwhile questions. And that's what makes my day. Uh, if you want to stay in touch, you can find me on Twitter. My first name, it's at the rate uh, Shri Raman. OK, Mr. Singh, as a last question, any good case studies you have come across in the past six months? Um, every successful uh, tech company out there uh, are a good case studies, right? And there are a million more small companies building amazing products every day. Uh, please remember, even a Google was started in a garage. And uh, look at where they have reached. That's because consistently delivering on customer satisfaction. So if you can deliver on what you promise, that's the biggest product development you can have. And uh, pleasure talking to you all. And see you guys. We'll stay in touch. Thank you so much.